Hi, my name is Kevin Halbert, and I believe I've figured out how the pyramids were made. This all started with the basic theory uh, that Jean-Pierre Houdin had. Um, his theories, I believe, some of them are correct, and a lot of them I disagree with. I think that they were done a different way. And this is, I'm going to share my theory and explain it, kind of compared to his theory, and then um, we'll explain it. So this is my 3D model. This would be the interior of the Grand Gallery with the walls removed. So uh, Houdin theorized that there was this trolley, and this trolley rolled on wooden um, uh, cedar logs up and down the um, pyramid, and uh, this was a counterweight system for uh, lifting the heaviest blocks in, in the internal chambers of the pyramid, it, lifting the blocks that were, in his theory, were only used to build the floors, the walls, and the ceilings, and the roof of the um, relieving chambers. But I disagree with that, but we're going to show how he, uh, how he, kind of how he theorized. Now, um, I believe that, that, that the other side of the pyramid, because this, this part right here was called the Great Step, and this was exactly in the center of the pyramid. And I don't think that was an accident. That was on purpose. Now, I believe that the, uh, the opposite side of the center of the pyramid um, was somewhat similar to this side. It could have been a, a shallower angle, but it was, my theory is that it was slanted. And I think Houdin believed his, his, uh, the pulling system of, the, of these counterweights went up and above the Grand Gallery and kind of along a roof and then down the outside of the pyramid to help lift them. You could, you could watch it all on his um, documentary um, uh, done by, uh, I think, National Geographic. But in any case, I'm going to show you how I believe the system, show you his system, and then we're going to show you how I think my idea varies and is simpler and faster. All right, so... Houdin theory uh, was uh, theory was that there was a what he called a large trolley or carriage that the counterweights rode upon um, that he thought rolled rolled along the top what they call the benches of this area. By the way, this is my theory that the pyramid had a um, almost a symmetrical. It may have had a shallower uh, incline on the lifting side, but this is my theory as to pretty much how they built the pyramids using the system. But he believed that the, there was a, a carriage that had rolled on cedar logs, and those rolled, rolled along these top benches, and that these slots were used to um, hold wooden uh, kind of fences to just kind of keep things um, uh, in, in alignment and stuff. And I do not believe that at all. I believe these slots were used as brakes to keep something from running away and sliding all down the Grand Gallery. And I'm not the first person to think of that. Um, the difference is, is the people that I've heard talk about using this as a break were thinking about the big granite blocks that were released and sent down the Grand Gallery straight uh, at the exact same angle and went straight to down what they call the ascending passage and then uh, stopped all the way at the entrance of the ascending pa pa uh, passage and were used as what they called plugging stones, okay? Um, but I don't know anyone that was talking about using them as uh, a brake for the carriage to keep the counterweights from running away. They were brakes for these weights as plugging stones, but not in the use of the counterweight system as far as I've heard. So I've yet to hear anybody that has talked about that. Whether it was on rollers or it slid on a sled, um, Houdin had a couple things that I, at least as far as I can tell from reading what, what little I have of his uh, theories and reports, is that this system, this counterweight system, had, and we'll, use, we'll just use these quarters here as exemplary weight. Okay, I have to interrupt my own video here. In this part, I'm showing what I believed was Jean-Pierre's idea of how the counterweight lifting system worked. The red part representing the carriage that would hold all the weights, and those quarters that were added to it would represent the weights that were used. And it was my understanding that half the weights were always staying in that carriage as counterweights, and the other half was removable. And that when, after the 
carriage had been moved to the bottom of the Grand Gallery after it had lifted a block to the top of the pyramid, half that weight would be taken out of the carriage and moved to the other side to equalize the weight so that they could reset the system and pull the carriage back to the top. And once the carriage was back to the top, the weights that had been taken out of the carriage to counterbalance the system would be returned to the carriage. Now that I've done some checking, I believe I'm mistaken in understanding that's not how the system worked. If I'm right, the weights were never removable from the carriage on the counterweight side. Instead, say there was 60 or 80 tons of weight on that carriage, it would stay there the whole time. And so a whole separate set of removable weights were manually moved to the opposite side of the lifting system and put on the lifting platform to reset the whole system and start it all over again. But my whole point here is in either case, the way that the system has to be reset by manually adding weights to the opposite side of the lifting system was very slow and very inefficient. And so I just want to be clear that either way is slow and inefficient, but also that the now I believe that Jean-Pierre's system was always one unit that it never changed. It was always used as just one solid set of weights. And I'm going to show you a more efficient way this system could be working. This would take an incredible amount of effort and time, and it would not be fast. And so this system, according to Dan, this whole system, the whole counterweight system, was dedicated solely to constructing the king and queen's chambers, and that's it. He had a theory that there was an internal spiral ramp that built the bulk of the pyramid. And I don't believe that. I believe this system, multiples of this system, by the way, were used to build the entire pyramid. And this system was a little more complicated because they needed a little more precision when setting these blocks for the king and queen's chambers. But a system like this was used everywhere in the pyramid. And there was, when they finished the top, there was a much simpler way to do it when they weren't lifting these massive 80-ton blocks because most of the blocks in the pyramid were about two and a half tons, about the weight of a car. Um, so this is his theory. I think it's, it, would, it would be slow. Um, it would be cumbersome. And because of it, the way it is, because of how slow it is, it could not have been used to, to build the pyramid in a reasonable amount of time. But I have a different theory, which I believe is faster and easier so I'm going to reset this and show you my system of how I believe uh, the counterweight system was used. I agree with Houdan as a counterweight system. I do not agree that it was only built to, to, uh, used to build the king and queen's chambers. So let me reset this to the way I believe the system was used to build the pyramids. The granite blocks that were found as the plugging stones, I believe, were also used as the counterweights in the counterweight lifting system. I believe that they were used differently and so um, this would be the sled that I theorized and this would be the block. We're just putting quarters in here to uh, represent the weights, okay? So this system would be in the, in the Grand Gallery. It would slide up on the bottom, lowest part of the floor of the Grand Gallery. It would be hoisted up using manpower to lift it up and then you would have your regular size block to lift up to, to be placed in the pyramid. Whether, whether you considered that the smaller granite blocks or the even smaller limestone blocks, this system would be lifted up and pulled down to lift this system, offload the system. They would lift the system back up, onload another one, and do it again. Now, when you wanted to put extra weight on, say the say the 80 ton block, the huge block, right? So you, you have a massive amount of weight to lift this time, right? This ain't gonna cut it. It's not enough counterweight, it's not gonna do it. But if you add another counterweight, because there were three blocks, three granite blocks found as plugging stones, you could lift that up, hook a loop, a pre-made uh, loop that would tie these two together and then you could do it again. And you could get three granite, 
blocks, and there may have been more blocks that were plugging stones that were made of limestone that were just broken apart and taken out of the ascending passage. If you guys know what I'm talking about, great. But the thing is, is that you could, if this was a reasonable uh, size weight a, a group of humans could lift, well, you could keep pulling up blocks and attaching them to each other so that they could do the lifting for one giant block. Not, and then when you offload this block and you need to reset it all, you would just untie these blocks. You would not have to offload the weight. You could reset the weight, put another giant block on, lift another weight, tie it to the weight in front of it, and do it again until you had enough counterweight that you could easily lift the biggest blocks in the entire pyramid, the 80 ton blocks. And each time you offloaded this, you'd be able to reset this to lift, lift the, uh, reset the counterweight in smaller chunks. And it would be so simple. It would be a, a lot easier. Now, one of the, there's some other details I'd like to share, okay? A lot of people talk about the, um, now this sliding weight would obviously have a lot more friction than if it were rolling on cedar logs as Houdin theorized, theorized, okay? But we do know that the Egyptians through their hieroglyphs have showed that when they were pulling their statues on sleds along uh, uh, to move them to a new location, they would pour water and, and tests have shown that if you pour water on, on the sand or whatever they were dragging it on, the friction coefficient was half. So it was, it was half as hard to pull. And I believe that that's what they did in this system. They just used what they already knew. They hooked these systems up. And then what they did was they poured water on this, probably with tafla, which tafla is a little known thing that is kind of like a, a very slick lubricant. Now, the thing is, is that normally when they were pouring, flu pouring fluids for the sleds to slide upon, they were on level ground. But this is not obviously level ground. So what they did was they poured uh, water or water with tafla onto the system, onto the floor of the Grand Gallery, and that made it much easier to slide this counterweight system. But that water, since it's on a slant, is going to flow downward. Well, that water is going to flow down here, down here. And where is it going to go? It's going to go further down outside of the Grand Gallery and straight down the ascending corridor. And that's where a lot of men were probably standing with ropes, helping to pull and actuate this whole system. And that water would be either absorbed or, or liquid would be absorbed or wasted or whatever. But we know that right here at the very bottom of the Grand Gallery, there is what they call the well shaft that leads down to the grotto. And history shows that when people dis rediscovered the pyramids, when they threw a rock down the well shaft, they heard a splash of water. So this would be an area where the lubricating fluid could flow and keep the entire floor of the Grand Gallery lubricated, but they could recycle the water that went down the shaft and didn't go down, keep, keep going down out of the Grand Gallery and out of the main entrance. It would just, there was even a lip on the edge of the bottom of the Grand Gallery that shows that it probably directed the liquid into the well shaft and that well shaft could be used to recycle if they sent buckets down uh, to pull, recycle that fluid and bring it to the top once again. Okay, so that's basically another theory that I have about it. The other thing I know is that this is a magic angle. It's 26 and a half degrees. It's just the, the sweet spot between uh, being easy to slip down and get started moving and being so vertical that you can't stop it from moving. It always wants to slide. And, and it's not such a vertical angle. It would be hard for humans to lift it. They wouldn't have to lift it vertically. And the point I'm making about the reason I bring that up is is that this angle isn't just used for the Grand Gallery. It, with the exception of a cup, just very few, almost all the large pyramids had this exact angle, but we didn't find Grand Galleries that had this exact angle going to their subterranean burial chambers. And that subterranean uh, terrain burial chamber probably doubled as its own sliding counterweight system 
for building the, uh, the pyramid on top of it because it was at the exact same angle. There was another thing that was interesting when they got to the bottom of these um, descending passages in the pyramids was that when they got to the bottom, they got wide, which would be a perfect area to pull the blocks in and push them aside if you were trying to put, you know, move stuff in and out of the pyramid, fix something or anything, because these blocks were the width of the tunnel, so it wasn't easy to work around them, but all, the, all of the major pyramids have an area where the block could either be pushed aside or it got wider on both sides, and then a person could walk around and hook up these connect weights, remove things, and do stuff like that. So I believe that, that was the system. And then when they built some of the pyramid above them, then they would build another counterweight system, then they would have a series of blocks. In addition to this, we also know that there is the great, uh, I believe it's the big void. It's a large area that they think may have been a second grand gallery that actually was at a better angle and altitude to lift the uh, final stones on top of the relieving chambers in the Great Pyramid. But in any case, there, I believe that these systems were repeated, that, that this, there wasn't just one of these. This one was a special one for the Grand Galleries, but a similar system was used to build all the pyramids. But they could use this system to actually build on top of itself. I, I'll have to do another demonstration of sh showing how you can lift a block above the top of the destination of the, of the, uh, of the pole uh, counterweight system. So this, this is the Grand Gallery without the walls on it. This is just the benches and the floors. Um, the thing is, is that if this system were to work as, if I, as I've described, it would be very difficult for a person to maneuver around here with these brakes, with these ropes, and all these systems. And they know that there are these slots in the walls of the Grand Gallery that run parallel to this angle. They don't, it doesn't go like this, it follows it, but at a distance at the same thing. And what I believe is there, those slots were so that they could slide wood in and it would make a catwalk for workers to attach these loops of rope that would bring one, which would attach one counterweight to the other one. And so uh, the Grand Gallery is very tall and that would be too far away for them to easily um, um, attach the loops of rope that connected one counterweight block to another. So just like they found in the air shafts, they found um, these copper hooks on, uh, that they believed had long wooden handles. And that would enable somebody to reach down if they had a catwalk with openings in it to reach down and um, use them to angle these loops of, of rope so that these two things could be connected. So that I believe that explains what those notches are in the walls of the Grand Gallery that are only a portion of the height of the gallery, but it would enable people to stand clear of the counterweights that they were connecting and operating and stuff like that. And um, one other point I'd like to make is that Houdin believed that this whole system was only used to build the king and queen's chambers. And the rest of the pyramid was built using a spiral ramp. Uh, he has a spiral ramp theory. And I believe that the reason that spiral ramp theory was used is because there's no one believed that they could lift blocks at such a high angle, um, they would have to lift it at like seven degrees or so. But if you had a counterweight system, you could, you know, chew, you know, divide up the weight into small chunks and then make that whole system lift something at a, a much higher angle. So his theory it had a, a ramp running around the, um, almost to the outer perimeter of the, of the pyramid, but that was an internal ramp with internal tunnels and, all this other stuff. And um, one point I'd like to make is that um, the Great Pyramid is Khufu's Pyramid. The second pyramid, which many people mistakenly believe was the larger pyramid because it's on a higher elevation on the Giza Plateau, is Khafre's Pyramid or Kefren's Pyramid. And the thing is, is that if it were true that you needed a spiral ramp system to build the Great Pyramid, the second pyramid, his son's pyramid, Khafre's pyramid, is almost the same size, so it had the same problem, so there would be a spiral ramp inside of that one. Also, another thing I'll say about the, the, the Khufu's pyramid, the first pyramid, the Great Pyramid, 
is that it's considered an eight-sided pyramid, not a four-sided pyramid, because there's an indentation on all sides. And I believe that is because they use systems like this, and they needed that system kind of countersunk into the pyramid uh, in order to put systems under it to block the weights and keep them from sliding down. And they had teams of workers that were um, basically running weights and stones up all sides of the pyramid. Either there was a counterweight on one side and the, uh, the load to be lifted on the other side. So there was either two or four lifting systems and these would be repeated up, up the pyramid. But in any case, um, I'll get into the other things that I believe uh, that how the pyramids were made, how they were constructed and stuff like that. The main point is this. The main point is that these were the, the, the granite blocking stones. They were divided into pieces. They were connected by men who were hanging from the ceiling and, uh, with, with hooks and, uh, and connections and stuff like that. And that's how they were able to move stones in, in, uh, uh, by resetting these counterweights quickly in little chunks and then just use them all collectively to, to lift a load and then be able to easily reset this whole system. So thank you.